Earlier, we spent some time to lay out some more efficiency beacon concepts. Each of these production facilities has been fine-tuned to produce the minimum pollution output possible at minus 80% power consumption. However, unlike with the furnaces, which can take only two modules each, the oil facilities and the assemblers can respectively take three and four modules each. That means to offset the stacked penalties of the additional tier 3 productivity and speed modules now, we're going to have to go with the space consuming square of beacons fully surrounding each individual assembler. Just like for the furnaces, we chose a single universal design for the oil facilities, which we'll get to later. But for the assemblers, I laid out three possible variants, with the price drastically increasing for every extra productivity bonus we desire. So, our bread and butter setup is going to be like the red chip assembler. It has 20% productivity bonus and 170% crafting speed. With space for two speed modules inside of the assembler, we can reach minimum pollution output very cheap, almost entirely using the tier 1 efficiency modules and the surrounding beacons. Only in two of the corner beacons, we needed to upgrade to tier 2 efficiency modules in order to exactly reach the minimum energy usage and pollution output possible. Now, each tier 2 module is roughly 10 times as expensive as a tier 1 module, while being not much stronger than a tier 1, so the fact that we only need to use 4 tier 2s to offset all the penalties is very good. The next setup, which is represented by the blue chip assembler, is significantly more expensive. It comes with an extra 10% productivity bonus for 30% in total, but at the cost of now needing 8 tier 2 modules in all 4 corners. Now, you may think that's not that much more expensive, and you'd be right if it were not for the difference in crafting speed. With only one speed module to offset the speed penalty of the productivity modules, this assembler's final crafting speed is only 105%. That means we need not 5, but about 8 of these bad boys to do the same job as the cheaper variant on the right side. And ultimately we have the setup with the maximum productivity bonus possible, represented by the yellow science pack assembler. A cool 40% productivity bonus, only to be used for the most expensive recipes, because this is one expensive boy. With no speed modules inside the assembler, the crafting speed is reduced to an absolute crawl by a minus 60% speed penalty from the four productivity modules. That means we need to bump the crafting speed back up by sacrificing one of the efficiency beacons and filling it with tier 3 speed modules in order to at least offset most of that speed penalty. That unfortunately means we cannot reach minimum pollution output unless we upgrade all tier 1 efficiency modules to tier 2, and even tier 3 in the four corners. And with a final crafting speed of only 90%, it is still slower than the previous setup. Ok, so let's just simplify all these calculations and just put an easy number on the cost of each of these guys. Assuming a tier 2 module is 10 times as expensive as a tier 1, and a tier 3 module is 6 times as expensive as a tier 2, and by including the modules in the beacons as well as in the assemblers, and compensating for the different speed penalties and bonuses of each setup, and compensating for some of the beacons effect by spraying to multiple assemblers when they are placed in the grid, here are the approximate final costs of each setup. Within these walls, we won't ever become rich enough to just slap tier 3 modules in every machine possible. So, now that we have a good understanding of the advantages and disadvantages of each of these setups, we can utilize that knowledge to decide how much resources we want to spend on each production step in the new base. Now, compared to the cheap tier 1 efficiency module, the tier 2 and tier 3 efficiency modules are extremely underwhelming considering their cost, so we try to limit their use to the minimum. But as it stands, it looks like we will need a handful of tier trees later for the most expensive assembler setup, so I reluctantly enable their production. So, now that we have finally cleared all the space while ensuring the old base's production continues, it is time to start on our new green base. The honor of placing the first cornerstone of our environmentally friendly base is given to Spider Ben, who decides to dedicate the first assemblers to any base's first step, the iron gear production. Now, because these bread and butter assemblers require tier 2 efficiency modules in only two of its corners, 
We need to remember to place these in pairs to ensure the beacons receive the right modules. Very nice. In the second column, we decide to produce pipes and underground pipes, and let's stash those annoying two intermediate products of copper wire and iron sticks here as well. They won't go on the main bus, but they will be available for the bots to pick up here and distribute them to the new manufacturing hub as needed. Before connecting the input belts and allowing any new production, we first need to move over the existing buffer from the old base. With the requests already set for the new buffer chests, all we need to do is change the old buffer chests to provider chests. And watch the bots fly. Alright, let's connect the input belts. And while I'm very focused on showing you my incredibly clever belt shenanigans for the copper wire, iron sticks and different pipes, I totally miss the fact that the iron supply for the gears is not working due to a missing underground belt, or the fact that expensive tier 3 productivity modules are scattered around the floor, despite I'm standing right next to them, pick them up already, OMG! No? Not? Well, suit yourself then. So the logistics bots remain busy for a while still, but we can also give the construction bots a project. With green chips being outsourced and iron gears theoretically being made at the green base if I hadn't missed that underground belt, we can deconstruct these production facilities at a smoggy red base now. I am a little sad about having to deconstruct my beautiful old base in order to make space for a more industrially bland looking fully beaconed base, but alas, there's just no other way if we want to continue our plans for world peace. This rusty, polluting old base has served us well and has given us plenty of scenic shots over the course of this playthrough, but ultimately it is time for this base to be picked apart piece by piece now. Actually, I lied about all these products purely going into buffer chests. The sneaky underground belt is going to pull off pipes to supply for the next assembly column of engines. So let's get those engines rolling off the belt. Engines are slow to assemble, so we need a fair few assemblers. Two, four, six, eight, Man, these fully beacon setups take a lot of space. This is only an 8 high stack of assemblers. We may run into problems with the northern supply lines being in the way soon. Anyway, let's grab steel and iron gears off the main bus and connect the pipes via our sneaky underground belt next door. And that's engines up and running. So now sir, thank you for your deposit, we just ordered a deconstruct issue here on your old engines and it's gone! Meanwhile the mystery of the spilled modules has been solved. Copy pasting a recipe which cannot benefit from productivity modules will physically eject the modules from the machine. Meanwhile, I made a questionable and frankly unnecessary decision of doubling my nuclear fuel setup, resulting in 84,000 fuel cells in stock, but that has completely depleted my dark green uranium-238 reserves. Well, I guess that just means there is no better time to finally set up nuclear fuel reprocessing than right now. From every 5 spent fuel cells we can recover 3 dark green rocks and we've collected over 10,000 spent fuel cells over the course of the game. Note that we've also upgraded every uranium centrifuge to be the greenest of green, 
with efficiency modules complemented by efficiency beacons. Every last centrifuge here is operating at minus 80% power consumption and outputting the minimum pollution possible, keeping in line with our promise to eventually upgrade every single last machine in our entire base to the absolute minimum pollution output possible. Anyway, there's also still a million ore in the uranium mine, so our dark green rocks should grow in number soon again. So while you were distracted by the shiny green uranium, I cleared a lot of space for our next project. I rerouted the ore belts and cleared everything else from the area, because it is time for the red chip build. And oh boy, do we need a big setup for that. We will start by locally producing copper wire before starting our 4 assembler white red chip setup. Nice! With 20% productivity bonus on the copper wire, each pair of wire assemblers can easily support 14 red chip assemblers instead of the usual 12, so we end up with 56 red chip assemblers. A giant setup indeed, but will it be enough? Our old base had 64 red chip assemblers, all outfitted with 40% productivity bonus, albeit working marginally slower than in our new setup. Anyway, for now it will have to do. Let's switch it on. OMG, it actually works. And this is definitely the first take of filming this. No kings in the copper cable here. But wait, where is the plastic coming from? Well, while you were distracted, I also built a completely new and green chemical plant block. Next to plastics, we have prepared chemical plants for all other bulk necessities. Sulfur, sulfuric acid, batteries and explosives. Anyway, yes, I am cheating a little here. None of this chemical plant block is yet connected to actual oil, so I'm using requester chests to bring plastic over from the old base, to be redistributed to my new green red chip setup, if you catch my drift. It reaches minimum pollution in much the same way as our cheapest assembler setup we're using right now, except that because chemical plants accept only 3 modules instead of 4, we can get away with encircling them with beacons in pairs instead of single units, saving us a lot of space. However, the trade-offs are that every chemical plant is affected by only 10 beacons instead of 12, meaning that we still require two corners with Mark II efficiency modules, instead of being able to go full El Cheapo like with our furnace stacks. The oil refineries are a special case. Because they are extra large buildings at 5x5 tiles, 
we can fit a whopping 16 beacons around it. That means we can even fit some extra speed modules in the beacons, which can still be offset by a few tier 2 efficiency modules in the 4 outside corners. For the raw oil processing we went for raw speed over extra productivity in order to keep the final size of the oil refining setup from getting out of hand. The old module 3 production is still going strong, but at 10 pollution per minute per assembler it's not exactly clean and green. That's why we built this shiny brand new module area, with the assembler surrounded by efficiency beacons, also the future model production area will be certified lean and green. And that leaves the space in the south to set up the whole greenly beaconed new oil processing and coal liquefaction area. And with the old version of those already being complicated enough to set up as it was, I am not looking forward to doing it all again while being constrained by tightly fitting beacon squares and pipe throughput limits. OMG indeed. In overconfident anticipation on how long it will take me to set up the new green oil area, we overconfidently stop all oil refining and coal liquefaction in the old base. Even with all the filled up buffer tanks for the oil products, it may turn out to be a bit premature. Yeah, actually we may have enough tier 3 modules for this moment. We have around 1000 of them each in stock now. These things are hella expensive and like mentioned before, we don't have infinite resources available to fuel production forever. So for now let's switch off model 3 production so our green, red and blue chip buffer chests can slowly start to fill up again. Also yeah, I am botting in coal now to keep lasting production going to make said red chips. Also also yeah, a wall breaks. I haven't heard that sound in quite a while now. Hey you, get in there. No? Well then, take this. Well, that was a sad waste of resources. Anyway, after a giant head scratch we start the scene at night so we can look at the pretty flames turning on in sequence. Don't worry, dawn is coming. So I was planning to say, while you weren't looking I quickly built a new green oil area but there was nothing quickly about it. I don't even wanna talk about how it all works. But I decided on a shared oil cracking area with an elegant single buffer tank system shared by both the oil refining and the coal liquefaction. This was a monumentally bad idea and it made it so much harder to try and keep priority on the free infinite oil production while not causing heavy oil shortages and deadlocks due to overproduction and ah. So here's the normal oil refining for as far as you can call this thing here normal. And yeah, 5 pipes of fluid don't fit in 4 tiles. And neither does a 3 wide T junction fit in the 2 wide space between the refinery and the beacons. So then this is the abomination you end up with, if you insist on keeping all your pipe intestines inside of your beacon body at least. And here's the oil cracking, which actually looks the most normal out of all setups in this whole area. Then here's the new green coal liquefaction plant. Coal liquefaction actually only deals with 4 fluids instead of oil refinings 5, so we can fit all the pipeworks in a slightly more normal way. However, the long handed inserters are just too slow at this point, so we had to make a new abomination, this time with belts, in order to feed them enough coal. Bonus points though for the steel buffer chests which can cash up to 4k coal per refinery to enable full speed bursts of high production requiring more than the two input coal belts.
Then here is our so-called elegant solution for the three different oil products of heavy oil, light oil and petroleum gas. Sure, the single share tanks are elegant enough, but the tangled forest of wires and circuit conditions to keep it all prioritized correctly without deadlocking rivals the electric cable mess in major Asian cities. But to add a positive touch, next to having all the functionality of our old oil setup, we have additionally programmed in a function to automatically prioritize coal liquefaction over oil refining in times where we need lots of heavy oil. For instance, if we decide we want to switch the entire base over to blue belts at some point, we will require literal tons of lubricant, which can be made only out of the otherwise somewhat rare byproduct of heavy oil. And here we have two offshore pumps supplying water for the whole oil industry. Well, when you zoom out far enough, it all looks pretty neat actually. That is, until you reach this weird tectone extension. So the whole system was supposed to be modular and it still kinda is, but the oil cracking ratios are off, so we need this extension to fully reprocess all unwanted byproducts from both the oil refining and the coal liquefaction. You can see I wasn't prepared for that because the darn stone mine is in the way of the beacons. Oh right, and here's rocket fuel already. Remember this moment, because ideally, after I'm done with this tour, I never want to come back to this oil nightmare here again. So let's finish up this tour then. Here's a billion pipes and pumps which pump oil in seemingly random directions, but trust me, there's method to the madness. Or so I presume. I can't see it now either, but the recording file name said so, so let's just hope the ghost of playing Mike past knew what he was doing. Then here's the green green lubricant, and another version of my so called passive petroleum gas splitter. Well, not so passive anymore now with all those wires connected to it, though I promise most of them have to do with the oil versus coal balancing thing. Anyway, switching on the whole oil shenanigans should theoretically have started production in all of these chemical plants. And indeed, we are now producing plastics locally instead of botting it in from the old base. Uh, sulfur is working, sulfuric acid is being barreled, we have a belt full of batteries and… Oh no, we missed another underground belt for the explosives. Oh well. Those are working now too then. And now we never have to set foot down there again. So next on the list are the yellow science ingredients of blue chips, low density structures and robot frames. Low density structures are also required for the rocket, and since we just built rocket fuel down there in the oil lands where we shall not speak of, that makes two out of the three ingredients needed for the rocket. So let's add the last one in the form of rocket control units here as well. So with both science production and module production suspended, we don't have much reason anymore to keep much of the old base around, so we disconnected the main bus belts again and start to shovel up everything inside, except our legacy rocket launch facility. Although it is very much in the way, I'd like to keep at least some legacy of the old days around somehow. So let's task the bots with emptying out all the remaining buffer chests. And then it really is time for the last part of my trusty old base to disappear into nothing.
Here goes the foundations of our old manufacturing hub. And here goes our old oil area. Don't blink twice or you'll miss it. And with the last remnants of the old polluting base fully deconstructed, pollution output has mostly ceased. And we can now finish building our green green base in green green peace. 